guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Reading Bear, and I hope you are ready for some more stories. And today, we'll take a look at some new entitled people content. If you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comment. And now, let's dive right into the stories. The first story is titled HOA harasses farmer, claims her work is illegal. Epic Farmer Revenge Summary Op lives in a rural town when people start moving in in an HOA form. When she starts building a coup, she gets complaints and letters from the HOA even though she never agreed to be a part of it. In order to spite them, she gets a permit to build an even bigger coup to put in her side yard to spite the HOA. Now, the HOA enjoys the sounds of the noisy chickens. My family and I have lived in a quaint little town for generations. We were not necessarily in the middle of nowhere, but the next biggest city was about a 203 hour drive depending on traffic. We live on the base of a mountain, and my brother and I actually inherited the current house we live in from my grandparents. My parents were close by, I grew up here, and it was great not to have to pay rent or a mortgage or anything like that. I know people will say things about small town life, but I honestly loved it. It felt like a tight-knit community that was held up by everyone's bonds and friendship. Our little town is pretty unique too, considering how diverse it is for a smaller population. We had a lot of little specialty shops and specialized restaurants that you normally would not find in a small town. I guess over the years our little town started getting more attention, because soon enough into my young adult years we had a nice mix small town folks, farmers, and city folk. Now, I do not really care where people are from, and I really hate to stereotype people. All I care is that you respect people and treat them with kindness. When the city folk started moving in, they began to complain about things right away. A lot of the complaints had to do with farmers, animals, etc. being next to your property. Well, my question is, if you knew you were not going to like that kind of life, why move here? And move next to a farm? People here had to make a living doing honest work, and no one ever had a problem with it before. A couple of these city slickers, no disrespect if you are reading this and live in the city, made it into the town government officials and soon enough, HOAs were being formed. Keep in mind that we were not built like a jam-packed city. So, for example, our houses were spaced apart instead of right up against each other. A lot of us also had land that needed to be maintained, and I knew that an HOA being formed would fine us for everything they could. Around the time the HOA started forming, my brother and I also started my own small farming business. We had some crops going, chickens, cows, and goats. We obviously were not a big operation, but after going through all the permits and whatnot, we were raking in some good cash. Now, I did not slaughter animals on my farm, so a lot of our business was dairy, goat milk and eggs. At one point we had so many eggs that we started giving them away to neighbors and homeless in town. Although homelessness was not really any issue in our town, it felt good to help people out. However, I guess the new HOA did not like me because they tried to fine me for operating machinery too early in the morning. Keep in mind, I never got a notice or invitation to join the HOA. A lot of other people joined because they felt pressured, or they even thought it would help build the city up. I am not sure, and either way I was not real interested. My brother and I just minded our business anyways. Why should care if Susan across the street has not cut her grass in three weeks, do you get what I mean? Anyways, I politely told them that I did not consider myself a part of this HOA because I never sign anything. Of course, they had a problem with that and tried to find me for every little thing. They tried to find me for my house being the wrong color, which was extremely silly because everyone on our street had a different color house. Who cares, does a different color really make a difference? After this, I started building a chicken coop because I planned to bring more chickens into our small farm since eggs were such a huge part of our business. And I guess I should have seen it coming. As soon as we started building the coop, the HOA comes at us saying that we do not have permission to do and that they are going to report us. Unfortunately for the HOA, I know my rules. I went to the city officials to make sure that I do not need any permits and whatnot. I would technically only need a permit if my coup were over a certain size. So, guess what I did? I started the process of getting a permit so I could build a bigger coup. Except I still kept building my smaller one because more coups noisier chickens. Which, I knew that that is what the HOA complaints were really about. 
They were trying to turn our street and other neighborhoods into quiet, meek street you would see in the suburbs or something. And of course, they still tried to complain about the smaller coup being built. They kept sending me letters and complaints, but I did not budge. But I was also smart and started building the bigger coup in the backyard where nobody could really see it unless they were right up against my fence. When it was done, I moved it to the side yard and when an HOA member came knocking on my door one day, I told them was nothing they could do about it because I had done everything right and shoved a copy of the permit papers in his face. The HOA does not bother me anymore. And no, I will not share my overflow of eggs with them. The next story is titled. Corrupt Condo Association Counters Change. It's been a few years, so I may have some details in the wrong order, but they're essentially correct. I purchased my townhouse in the late 2000s. The previous owners were motivated to sell, for a good price. It was exactly what I wanted, two bedrooms, multiple bathrooms, and a garage. From the mandatory home inspection, I was told about several potential problems with the unit. Some were internal, and others dealt with an outside balcony, leaky windows and cracked exterior paint. Before finalizing the sale, I was given the opportunity to ask about these issues and was told that I was responsible for everything inside the townhouse, and the outside problems were handled by the condo association, and I just had to submit requests for repair. The condo association fee was very cheap for this area, so I considered that a plus. I closed on the sale, and I moved in without any problems. The total number of units in the complex is about 130, so it's a decent size. Some have two bedrooms, some three, and only a few, like mine, have garages with exterior balconies on them. When I moved in, I was presented with a list of the association's bylaws for the property. Nothing major, most were what you'd expect, like keeping your entryway clean, dogs on leashes, guest parking, and such. There was a one pet limit that I could see everyone was ignoring, so I saw they were a bit lenient with the rules. I became friends with a neighbor, and she told me that the association was slow to handle problems. In fact, most of the units, conjoined in groups of six or more, were in dire need of new paint. Almost every unit had problems with their windows, but, the association was only replacing windows on the backs of the units, and only a handful at a time. The association's communication was pretty poor. We'd get infrequent newsletters, but they had an underlying tone of, we'll get to your issues when we can, no sooner than we feel like. They would also announce condo association board elections, but there seemed to be little interest, so they would appoint other owners to the board, as needed. About two years in, I got a printed newsletter from an owner in the complex, who we'll call Mike, claiming the board is ignoring the owners. It detailed a few things that weren't being addressed, like the paint and windows, and owner protests were being ignored. The board wasn't even holding annual open user meetings, which are specified in the association by laws. Those meetings were also for holding elections of new board members. The letter demanded a change in the situation. Enter Karen. Not her actual name, but it rhymes with Karen. She was the association's treasurer on the board. She was controlling the board and her word was apparently, law. That newsletter specifically called for her to step down. Next thing we know. There's an official association newsletter mailed to us, that calls the owner's newsletter a complete fabrication, and claimed Mike had ulterior motives. There was nothing to address the problems Mike mentioned, it was just generalized attack on him. Mike was initially asking for access to the association's books, and the association refused to show them to him. This is guaranteed in the association by laws. We received another newsletter detailing this and how he was going to take them to court if he was continually blocked. Another response from the association was mailed, but it was just attacking Mike and questioning his motives. I was visited by another neighbor, who was circulating a petition demanding change, and I gladly signed it. Nothing was being done, aside from standard groundskeeping and the occasional emergency repair. We received a few more newsletters from Mike, and several rebuttals from the association. Mike successfully sued to have access to the books. From the newsletters, he reported that what he saw was just a list of code numbers, not names, and dollar amounts for payouts. There was no way to really know who was receiving the money, or why. Somewhere in all these newsletters it was revealed that Karen, who was an accountant, was being paid by the association for her time, she's an accountant. Mike's newsletters also revealed that Karen chose the maintenance company, which was managed by, Marin, Karen's sister. Wow, what a surprise, not. The situation was getting worse. 
Tensions were high. Somewhere in here, the association mailed out a newsletter that claimed all the rebuttals they were mailing out were costing them a lot of money, more like $50, if you considered the postage, and it had to stop. Also, they announced that they were accepting candidates for the new election, and the form had to be mailed back in by a certain date. It was a step in the right direction, but I soon realized that we received the newsletter on a Saturday, and the deadline for submitting was the following Tuesday. Karen could easily claim that no one had sent in their forms by the deadline. Other owners told me she'd been doing this trick for years, so she could appoint anyone she wanted to the board. The association was using a P.O. box, and the only way to get an application in on time was to go to the post office where the box was on Monday, and send a certified letter, to prove that it was received in time. Fat chance. Mike and his friends had hand-delivered those newsletters. One time, I saw someone walking around the complex, delivering the newsletter. I went down to retrieve it from my mailbox, right away, but I also noticed that Karen was going to every mailbox, pulling these newsletters out and was throwing them into the garbage as she went. I heard her say something like, it wasn't legally mailed. After that event, Mike sued to force a proper election, and the judge ordered it. For the election, we had to have a two-thirds owner majority present, either by attendance, or by signed proxy. On the day of election, many of us arrived at the meeting, and we noticed a security guard was standing by Karen, who was checking everyone in and giving them a ballot. She was expecting trouble. I heard her tell people they couldn't vote, because they were in arrears with their monthly dues, had outstanding fines, or were told they weren't the official owner of record. She disqualified many people. There were some arguments, but the security guard kept things civil. Note that our bylaws don't say anything about who can and can't vote, aside from the owner on record. On top of that, only a couple of candidates made it onto the ballot, excluding Mike and several others, who had definitely applied. The meeting started with Karen giving some general information, and the members were talking amongst themselves a lot. Many were poed about being refused a ballot, and others were complaining about all the candidates missing from the ballot. One of the last bits of information was that Karen announced that they would refuse any future letters sent by certified mail, because it required someone to go to the post office and acknowledge delivery on a certain date. She would normally get the mail whenever she felt like it. Karen was trying to circumvent the law by conveniently ignoring timely letters, like candidate applications and our monthly dues. Some owners brought up the possibility of re-entering Mike and the other candidates onto the ballot as write-ins, and the crowd voted with him, but the board refused to recognize the vote. Lastly, the votes were collected and counted, but the board president announced that they didn't have a two-thirds majority, so the election would be cancelled. We were only short a few people. The number of people Karen didn't give ballots to would have tipped the balance, surprise. The board quickly adjourned the meeting and left before people realized what was happening. That was a fun night. No one was happy. Mike was paying out of his own pocket for his lawyer, and it was getting expensive. I heard the number $20,000 mentioned. People did help defray the cost by donating to the cause, though. Mike was not done. He went back to court another time, to sue for a legal election. There was nothing in the bylaws that denied voting rights for past due balances, and Karen lied about at least one owner not being the owner of record. Armed with that information, the judge ordered another election, to be supervised by an independent, third-party lawyer. As I recall, the association's lawyer quit, because they kept going against his advice. They replaced him with a yes man. The third party lawyer was in complete charge of the election, including collecting candidate applications. A reasonable deadline for applications was set, two weeks, and proxy ballots were sent out, as well. Karen's position was up for election, as were two other positions. We found out that the board president was appointed by Karen, but he was not an owner, and had to step down. Only owners can serve on the board. Finally, the election came pretty much everyone showed up, or had provided proxy votes. There was definitely a two-thirds majority present, not including proxy votes. The lawyer called for three volunteers from the owners to count the ballots. The results were that four new people joined the board that night. They had gotten around 80 to 90 votes each. Another active board member got 17 votes, and Karen got 15, or something like that. We presume her votes were all proxy votes. I was wondering if they were going to go after Karen for getting paid and cooking the books, but the new treasurer received everything with proper records, names, this time, and not numbers. 
The maintenance company was tossed out, almost immediately. Karen sold her unit and moved to Florida, but not before arranging for some exterior beautification around her unit, complete with plant boxes, flowers and shrubs. We think she saw the writing on the wall and moved out before any backlash could occur. The association's lawyer was also replaced. Then came the bad news. The association had to pay out almost $50,000 in legal fees to fight against Mike in his lawsuits. Since the association was paying for the lawyer, we couldn't put the bill on Karen. What a pity. We later discovered that the long-term project fund, used for major upkeep of the complex, was pretty badly depleted, and needed to be refilled. Our lawyer advised us that for the size of the complex, it needed to be over $2 million, but there was less than $1 million in the fund. Fortunately, they didn't demand assessments, but instead, raised the monthly dues to start making up the difference. In the 15 years, I've been here, the dues went from $150 to $375, and go up annually now. Karen had ignored many of the longer-term projects, and in the next two to three years, the buildings were repainted, the roofs were re-shingled, bad windows were replaced, and all the balconies were completely rebuilt. In more recent years, our insurance company demanded we repave the roadway, because it was falling apart in places. They wouldn't insure it unless that was done immediately. These days, we have a better and more responsive maintenance company, and a Facebook page for general announcements and chit-chat. There are no real winners in this case, but after all of the required improvements were done, most of us feel better living here than during the dark time of Karen's reign. Thank you for listening.